This is Clinical Conversations, COVID-19, the Sleep Medicine Perspective. This is a product of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, Sleep and Public Safety Committee with Indira Guru Bhavagatula and Shannon Sullivan. And we are honored to be joined today in conversation with Dr. Seema Kosla. She is medical director of the North Dakota Center for Sleep in Fargo, North Dakota as well as the AASM Task Force Sleep Telemedicine uh, participant and chair of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Presidential Technology Committee. Thank you so much, Dr. Kosla, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And to dive right in, uh, you are based in North Dakota, a location with a sleep medicine practice needs that are pretty distinct from more urban locations. What considerations went into making your policies regarding COVID-19? Oh goodness, this has been challenging. We have some facilities that are hospital-based and we have IDTFs. And we really had to look at the incidents in that particular area in terms of um, rate of transmission. We had to look at hospital policies and we really had to pay attention to our schedule, what was, what was coming through the door. So, you know, our, our, I would love to tell you that we have this really distinct policy right now, but uh, it's very fluid. We're changing as we start to test more. We've been kind of on the tail end of a lot of this, but we uh, just had our first deaths in North Dakota. Um, we also border Minnesota, so we've had, a, you know, some deaths in Minnesota as well. Um, we have a facility in South Dakota, and they're having a lot more cases. Uh, and so we are trying to figure this out along with everybody else. And to take a step back, currently in your practice, how are you handling in-person clinic visits versus uh, laboratory-based testing versus home sleep testing? So we have locked the doors. <laughs> so you need the key to get in. Uh, we are 100% telemedicine now. Uh, and we have really tried to be thoughtful about who is coming into the lab. We have stopped any sort of pap therapy in the lab. We have delayed titrations. Um, we are probably going to stop in-lab testing altogether uh, in the next week or so and plan to restart it in about a month. Thanks, Seema. Um, yeah, so you've hit on the three major points of contact, um, you know, that we have for our patients, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, outpatient clinic and lab testing and home-based testing. Have you thought about using disposable monitors or... We have, um, you know, some of the, mm -hmm. so we're doing it in two ways. We are um, securing disposable HSATs, but also disposable components for PSG. Uh, we've tried to be very thoughtful about our lab space uh, and to make sure that we have um, like mattress protectors, for example, and removing anything that is sort of decorative in the room. Uh, we don't want anything to be, you know, a fomite. Uh, and so we're also trying to, uh, we, we just received an email from one of the companies telling us that they have disposable uh, rip belts, for example, for HSAT. And so I think we're going to see this movement for more disposable pieces, at least. Yes, I, I can see that, that, that uh, at this time, in this time of need, that that might offer a, a distinct solution. Now, in terms of switching your clinical operations over to more telemedicine-based services, which solutions did you find to be most helpful? And how did you get all of these patients? I'm sure you have a busy practice. How did you get them all notified and set up over such an abrupt, um, you know, sudden change in the way you, you, uh, you do business? Well, it was kind of funny because we literally, so we call, um, you know, obviously, to remind our patients, and we just say, you know what, from now on, we are doing telemedicine. And it's kind of funny, we've been surprised by how many people were on board. So I think we only had one person that is scheduled on Monday, only one person opted to delay their appointment. Everyone else is excited about it. Uh, and so we have just been calling people. Right now, we're giving them a choice between FaceTime and Skype, but I've been playing with the Sleep TM platform today to try to get that up and running. Uh, I think that might be a better solution for us down the road. Um, but it's been kind of fun. I met um, somebody's dog yesterday. 
I met their grandson. I met someone else's wife. So it's really been kind of fun uh, to be able to go in and see their sleep spaces and, and kind of see where they live. That's great. And, um, you know, interestingly, what, I, what I'm finding, if I may share, is that everybody knows what kind of mask they wear because they're able to reach over and pick it up and read the name right off of it for us. So Isn't we're getting great? lots of detailed information. Yeah. And to piggyback on that, it's so great um, when possible to be able to see people um, near their own sleep environment because there's so many additional details you can pick up um, that you may not normally get in clinic. Moving on, what sort of operational challenge changes and challenges um, have you encountered um, in addressing additional patient calls and concerns in this environment? So we've had to do a lot of education for anybody patient facing. So our scheduling staff, for example, my clinic um, front desk staff, just to both in terms of screening, uh, have they had a fever, for example, or the typical symptoms of it had a change in uh, their sense of smell or taste, but also the volume. I think as more patients find out that there's this concern of aerosolization with CPAP, uh, then they're concerned. Uh, and so right now we've been able to ha handle that volume with our current staff. Uh, we've just done a lot of education for our staff. And do you have a call center where you work that, that triages phone calls to the medical staff and, uh, um, and medical assistants or does everything come straight through to your clinic? So we have both. We have a scheduling department for the other locations. Uh, and so they are doing a good job of educating and triaging, but in terms of, and a lot of different referring physicians will just email me or call me, um, but then the other clinical concerns come through to my clinic. Um, we are uh, uh, getting some um, messages into the academy from some patients who are concerned that using the CPAP may make the viral infection worse for themselves or perhaps spread it to others in their home environment. And what have you been recommending uh, your patients about this? Um, and what are you suggesting regarding the way they clean or replace their, um, their, re their uh, disposable supplies? I think this has been really interesting. So every patient that I've seen via telemedicine, I do a little um, assessment of what we together think their risk of having it is. We have a conversation about the risk of transmission while they're asymptomatic. Uh, and then I do tell them that this is something we're concerned about based on the data from SARS in Toronto. And I, I ask them about whether they've been practicing social distancing, uh, whether they have had a, a contact, or if they think that they are unwell, and if they share a sleep space with anybody. And for somebody who does share a sleep space, then we have had that conversation about, well, can you move to a separate bedroom until this plays itself out? Um, I, I try to really uh, emphasize the importance of cleaning everything with soap and water. And also, uh, as Indira had pointed out earlier, it's really important uh, that they wash their hands before they handle their mask. Uh, it's funny because a lot of them will immediately have this guilty look on their face when I talk about how important it is to clean their sleep out. And so I think it really emphasizes that, oh, you know what, this actually probably is a really important time to get into cleaning and I probably should get new equipment. And, and so it's been an interesting conversation. Yeah, I would be curious uh, whether this um, epidemic will ultimately result in just better hand hygiene and better care of CPAP units overall. I'm, I'm a silver lining, too, I, so I, yeah. hope so. I hope so. Thank you so much for pointing out also how important it is to really assess every patient situation because there are so many things that are different in terms of family members, other people that might be around individual risk. Patients coming in for visits um, may also interact with staff including clinicians, technologists, medical assistants, respiratory therapists, office staff. Um, so thinking back before um, you, you temporarily um, close those clinic doors for in-person interactions between patients and staff, 
how did you address concerns regarding safety? And, and maybe even more relevant than thinking back is how, um, when it's time to unlock the doors and, and, and start up your in-person practice again, how will the, um, current, the current situation influence how things go for you going forward? So I was very surprised about um, maybe three weeks ago, somebody stole hand sanitizer out of our clinic. And we kind of laughed about it. We couldn't figure out who did it. And we just laughed about it a little bit. Maybe it was four weeks ago. But since then, we have really, you know, taken germicide to everything in the office. We have plenty of hand sanitizer. Um, and we've adopted this practice where we would only have um, one patient come in and we wouldn't allow their family members to sit in the waiting room. They would wait in the car. And so we wouldn't have a queue of patients. And we made sure that everybody respected the six feet of distance. Uh, we did a lot of hand sanitizer both before and after. Uh, and I physically moved where the patient sits, moved it as far away so that we could have that social distancing, even in that closed clinic room. So anything else you would like to add that would be of help to our colleagues? I know the situation is changing very quickly, um, but just any final thoughts? Do you know what I have found very helpful is and what to me has been a little bit heartwarming is how um, I think a lot of people in our medical community have really um, leapt forward with collaborative approaches to things and, you know, reaching out and asking questions and not really being afraid of asking questions anymore, you know, and to say, well, why couldn't we do this and help me understand that? And have you seen this? And so I see this wonderful collaboration with ASM members with non-sleep clinicians. Um, I think a lot of people are interested in telemedicine, for example, and a lot of what we do in sleep medicine uh, via telemedicine, I think is very easily translatable to primary care or endocrine or any of those other, um, any of those other specialties. And so I see us, um, I hope, becoming stronger as a group. You know, I think we have a lot of good resources on social media. We have a lot of good resources on the ASM uh, website, which are constantly changing. I, I check it every day, and I don't think it's been the same for more than a couple of days in a row. Are there, in, in, in your environment right now, are there any uh, thoughts being given to redeployment of, of uh, essential workers? Uh, should a surge occur in your area? So, for example, if the labs are closed and you have um, people that are knowledgeable at setting up, uh, you know, ventilators, you know, respiratory therapists, um, is, is, are there any discussions happening around that? It's funny that you say that. We have sent a letter out to our hospital partners. Um, and, and I think it's important to recognize that people in the sleep world um, do come from a, a lot of varied backgrounds. Some of them are RTs, some are LPNs. Um, and importantly, if they're already working within that hospital system, they are vetted, they are trained, they understand the electronic medical record, and I think they really could be an asset for those hospital systems. So we have been reaching out to our hospital partners, um, asking them uh, if, if this is somebody that they could find helpful in the case of a surge or even uh, because they are not having enough staff due to illness. I have a question, uh, Dr. Kosla, about longer term. Do you think our experience with COVID-19 will in some ways permanently change the practice? Maybe a larger percentage of patients uh, going through telemedicine, for example. I do. You know, the first day that we switched to 100% telemedicine, I think I had four patients that absolutely did not want to do it. <laughs> and so they said, I don't want to mess with that. I'm not worried. I'm doing fine. And the rest of the patients that day were really kind of pleasantly surprised. And they told me how much they liked doing it. I have two short stories I'd like to share with you, if I may. Uh, one of my patients was a family practice physician who is older, and I saw him via telemedicine. And, you know, for an initial visit, I reviewed his, um, his polysomnography, I reviewed his download. Uh, and so when we started the visit, you know, we we're chit-chatting. His, his nurse actually had to help him because he couldn't get the microphone going. 
and so then we had our visit and, and I was just visiting with him and he said that his practice was down 99% and he's thinking about telemedicine. And so we visited, had our visit, I showed him everything. And at the end, he started asking me these really technical questions. He said, how are you doing that? What device are you on? How are you showing me my download? How are you moving that pointer? And I explained it to him. And at the end of it, this elderly family practice doc said, I am really excited about telemedicine. This was awesome. And so I had another lady the other day who was in her bedroom when we were doing telemedicine and we we're just visiting and she has, um, you know, she has always had hypersomnolence and, and more recently has developed insomnia. And so we spent some time discussing it. And, and it turns out that she is using this green light for migraines before she goes to bed. And I kind of think it's causing a delayed sleep phase and leading to insomnia. And so I'm not sure that I would have picked that up in clinic. So I think telemedicine provided us that, that unique perspective into that sleep environment. Thank you so much for sharing those stories. And in fact, um, this entire conversation. Again, this is COVID-19, the sleep medicine perspective. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today, Dr. Seema Kosla in Fargo, North Dakota. And for more um, information about from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine regarding COVID-19, please visit our website.